Hi everyone. Let me start by thanking Romain and the organising committee for inviting me to give this keynote uh, and for organising the overall symposium uh, under a challenging situation. It's a shame we can't all be together. I've come to this meeting every every time since 2011 and I'm glad to be participating in this one in, in some way. Hopefully I'll be awake at the time of this presentation. Right now I'm delivering it from my home office in uh, on a sunny morning in Melbourne. And the talk that I'm presenting is called, What is the Status of Metabolic Theory One Century After Putter Invented the Von Bertel Amphi Growth Curve? It's based on a paper that published last year in the journal Biological Reviews. And in it, I was basically trying to uh, get my own head around um, all the different ideas out there about growth and the role of, uh, of Putter in all of this. Um, and it's a really interesting story, and uh, I certainly found it a very clarifying um, exercise, and I hope you do too. So how I came to actually be interested in this, though, was as an ecophysiologist, I was um, starting to learn about the fact that I really need to understand a bit more physics to uh, understand ecology. I always wanted to be an ecologist and never thought that physics and mathematics was that important to being an ecologist. Um, but this book, Biophysical Ecology by David Gates, changed that. Um, so in that book, David Gates, who is a physicist who got interested in botany, emphasised that each ecological process or event has to be studied in its full complement of physical and biological, biological components. This requires that the physical principles of ecology be dealt with by the ecologist as thoroughly and correctly as the physicist deals with physics and the chemist with chemistry. And I got into biophysical ecology in part by reading the papers of Warren Porter, who was a co-founder of that field, where they were trying to use physical principles to predict the temperatures of animals and the heat exchange um, in, in natural environments. And I got really excited about this possibility, especially in terms of being able to forecast the consequences of changes in environment, changes in climate, changes in as a result of habitat modification and so on. Uh, on organisms and so that is very much around the topic of this symposium and forecasting uh, e effects on organisms of changes in environment. So I, I really began to appreciate the power of employing these mechanistic approaches that are using physics to understand heat exchange and um, so that was that was pretty exciting to me and so I decided to uh, spend a year in the US um, learning more about this from Warren Porter I took with me a book on the plane called Macroecology by Jim Brown. And this also got me very excited because it was saying similar things to what I guess I was picking up from, from learning about biophysical ecology. In particular, the role of energy and how important energy can be and the way it fluxes through individuals in understanding um, ecological patterns in general. And so what Jim was emphasizing in this book was how the the conversion of energy into biological work is the essence of fitness. So it's theoretically possible to express D and DT as in population growth rate in terms of changes in energy or some other similar thermodynamic currency. And it should be possible to do this in practice. So Jim was having this vision of, of being able to understand big patterns in ecology using some fundamental principles relating to energy. And that was to me very exciting. And so I, I spent some time with Warren Porter and I began to appreciate it's not just about energy, but energy and mass budgets. This is what is, is really important. That's what I really need to be focusing on and learning about. And so I was walking um, around a bookstall at the evolution meetings that were held in Illinois at the time. And I saw this book, Dynamic Energy and Mass Budgets in Biological Systems. And that phrase, energy and mass budgets, caught my eye. And I had a, had a look through the book. And in the book, Bas Koyman says that the, uh, it, it, the aim of this theory is to unify commonalities between organisms as prescribed by the implications of energetics and how this links across multiple uh, levels and that the theory presents simple mechanistic rules about the uptake and use of energy and nutrients and what that means across the whole organism's life cycle. And so I thought, wow, this, this might be a, a way to um, build on what we were doing with the biophysical models in those models, we had metabolic rate, for instance, as, a, as, a, as part of the equations, because that's producing part of the heat, but we just used an allometric function to get the metabolic rate. And I thought this book might provide the theoretical context to actually calculate the metabolic rate from first principles and become even more uh, mechanistic in, in how we're characterizing the organism and its ability to survive in different environments. So 
this this was all happening in about 2002 um and and was very exciting to me but then um i started to notice as i started to read more widely that there was this big thing going on about the scaling of metabolic rate and explaining this um and it was the, the paper by west brown and inquest um often abbreviated as wbe where they argued that they had a novel uh, and mechanistic explanation for the way that metabolic rate scales with size explaining the mysterious quarter power scaling and the essence of the idea was that it was to do with um, fractally branching networks that are distributing resources to cells and the way that network is constraining supply results in quarter power scaling and they also had a, a paper um, about ontogenetic growth based on this idea and what I found confusing was that there wasn't a whole lot of reference to the dynamic energy budget theory in these papers and in, in general in the, in the literature it just didn't seem clear to me what was going on like were these new ideas were they building on the old ideas um, what should I do what what theory should I use how should I go about trying to achieve what I wanted to achieve in terms of integrating metabolism formally into the biophysical equations that I was learning about so this was puzzling to me but clearly it was getting everybody very excited this idea of um, individual metabolism this um, this overview article that was in plus biology called ecology's big hot idea was all about what brown and colleagues were saying based in part on their on their fractal idea but more generally on the idea that you can understand uh, a whole lot of things in ecology if we can better understand individual energetics and so some little quotes that you they're in this article uh, if the theory is right, it's one of the most significant in biology for a long time. Uh, metabolic rate can explain growth, development, population dynamics, molecular evolution, the flux of chemicals through environments, and patterns of species diversity, to name a few. It would provide a common functional basis for all biodiversity. Ecology is now like quantum mechanics in the 1930s. We're on the cusp of major rearrangements and syntheses. So, real great deal of excitement about the possibility of understanding ecology through metabolism and really reviving physiological ecology as a discipline. Okay, so this is the paper that uh, I'm summarizing and the contents of the remainder of the talk is essentially following along the table of contents for this article, um, which may be a little bit small to read, but basically into, in the introduction, I'll go through some general concepts just to get us all on the same page. Then I'll go and summarize the existing growth models, and then I'll do an overall comparison and synthesis of these different models. So first of all, by way of introduction, I just wanna make a couple of points. And, and the first one is that um, metabolic theory um, is really about individual growth models. So while in general, the discussions about metabolic theory are focusing on this equation, um, when, when in terms of the metabolic theory of ecology as promoted by Jim Brown and colleagues, this equation uh, in metabolic rate is an allometric function of body mass and a, with a temperature correction. Um, this is, is essentially what a lot of people think of as the metabolic theory of ecology, as, as the metabolic rate, the, the rate at which organisms are fluxing energy through their environments. And Brown and colleagues emphasize the pattern that that things at the individual level like metabolic rate and development rate but also things at the population level like mortality rate and population growth and things at the community and ecosystem level like carbon turnover and species richness have signatures of, of this constraint of energy flowing through individuals in terms of the way it scales with size and the way it responds to temperature and, and and that's the emphasis that you know we can understand a lot in ecology from this kind of thing but it's not just um understanding scaling, it's really under, having a, a, a proper theoretical model of the growth process. A similar paper was written about five years early saying essentially the same thing by Roger Nisbet, who was the, the lead author, but um, Eric Mueller and Dina Licker and Bas Quemen, saying that yes, we, we have the um, these models of individual energetics and we show how they can link to processes below the individual and above the individual and explain body size scaling relationships. But the emphasis here is on a individual model of growth where you've got all of the different aspects of the metabolism included so maintenance but also growth and reproduction and development and how they're all connected and so when we're talking about metabolic theory the theory is about individual growth models and we need to get those models correct um, before we can go above to interpret things from a mechanistic point of view uh, in ecology and in biology in general 
And so I'm using the word mechanistic and I just want to be clear about what I mean by that um, versus another term that's often used as as the you know the opposite, which is phenomenological. Sometimes people call them formal models or correlative models, but the distinction I'm trying to make here is between things that are explicit about processes and things that are implicit about processes. So the phenomenological models are process implicit. They're modeling things at the level of the phenomena of interest and not breaking it down into sub processes about the actual underlying mechanisms, whereas a mechanistic model does. So if we think about something that's nothing to do with metabolism, if we think about predicting soil temperature, you can do this either way. You can develop a statistical model where you get data on soil temperatures and you fit a, a, a model with some kind of lag factor and has rainfall and temperature coming in as predictive variables. And you can develop very sophisticated statistical models that accurately allow you to predict soil temperatures at different levels. And that's what Brian Horton and Ross Corkery did for Australian soils. Um, or you can take a mechanistic, uh, mechanistic approach and be explicit about the processes of heat flow. Um, heat uh, reaching the soil surface and the way that the heat's flowing through the soil as a function of the properties of the soil um, in terms of conductivity and heat capacity and so on. And that's what Mitchell and colleagues did. Um, that included Warren Porter in trying to develop a microclimate model. So you have these two different ways of going about modeling the same thing. Both can be very successful at prediction. But the power of mechanistic models is twofold. One is that you actually can understand better what's going on. Um, and understanding is very satisfying as a scientist, but also in terms of forecasting, it allows greater power. And so with a mechanistic model of soil temperature, you could apply it anywhere where the physics applies. And of course, that means you could apply this model to the surface of Mars and predict the soil temperatures on Mars, just changing the parameters for the conditions in Mars. Whereas um, you could not translate this statistical model of soil temperatures for Australia to Mars, it just wouldn't work. Um, and so in the context of of growth models. Uh, just to give you an example of a, a, a phenomenological model, um, Marshall and White were trying to understand the empirical pattern for some organisms to reproduce out of proportion with body size in a hyper allometric way. And they were trying to understand how could you modify growth models to account for this. And they, they, they said, well, if, the, if there is a, an income rate of energy that is scaling with the same power as the maintenance rate, um, that's why you have these two parallel lines of income and expenditure, but there's a term relating to um, reproduction that's been taken away from the growth that's scaling um, allometrically with a power of greater than one, then you could get this pattern that they saw in reproduction. But this is all focused at the level of growth and doesn't actually have any of the sub -process, processes explicit. It doesn't have an energy and mass budget going on of the organism with all the different processes of energy uptake and usage and allocation. Um, whereas the models that I'm wanting to talk about in this talk are those that do, those that are being explicit about the actual dynamics of energy being taken up um, and, and then used within the organism. And um, what I'm trying to do is put this into the historical context. And the most important thing to do here is to put it into the context of Putter. Um, so August Putter was um, a physiologist who was born in 1879 and died in 1929 and he lived his whole life in Germany and I think he wrote everything in German that he ever did. Um, he got his PhD in 1904 in physiology and, and, and had various positions at universities in Germany. And there's an article I found on the theories of August Putter um, by Johnson and he emphasized that August Putter is especially remembered for his theories on the nutrition of marine animals. He was basically pointing out the importance of dissolved um, organic matter in the, in the ocean and how this could be really important for a lot of organisms. And I think those theories ended up being debunked largely, but uh, and, and not a whole lot is known about Putter. You can see that, that this author thought that he died in 1935, whereas in the previous slide I said he died in 1929. But Every, he has had a massive influence on, on our understanding of growth models because he invented the first one. And he did that in a paper in 1920, which was translated into English, um, fortunately, and the, the, the paper's called Studies on Physiological Similarity Analogies of Growth. And in that article, he developed an equation for growth, um, which in integrated form looks like this, which many of you will be recognizing as the von Bertel-Amphrey growth curve. 
So how did this happen? Why is the von Bertalanffy growth curve named after von Bertalanffy and not August Putter, seeing Putter invented it? Well, that's what we want to get to the bottom of in this talk and try and understand how has Putter's work um, influenced subsequent work in metabolic theory. Okay, so now I'm going to go through the different existing growth models and I'm going to try and um, show how they relate to each other and I'm going to use the same, roughly the same sort of formulation, um, I'm going to write the equations of growth in the same way, and I'm going to use the dynamic energy budget theory notation approach um, to do this, to try and as much as possible show the similarities and differences between these models, because they're often written in very different ways, and it's hard, I certainly found it very hard to try and understand the differences when they were all written with different symbols and different formalisms and different structures. So here is the growth model of Putter written in this way, where we have the rate of change in the volume. So that's what Putter's working with, um, the volume of the organism. And he's got this rate of change being a difference between two terms. Term on the left is related to buildup, so the anabolic process. The term on the right is related to breakdown, so catabolic processes. So we have these processes that are making the organism build up, um, and these processes are happening proportional, at a rate proportional to the surface area, volume to the two thirds, with a, a parameter here, Ka. And the breakdown process is happening proportional to the volume. So it's got a volume specific parameter, um, Kc. So you can see I've got the curly brackets around a surface area specific parameter and a, the square brackets around a volume specific parameter as in the Deb theory notation. And so what this means, because you have this process that's happening um, on the left that's building up to the two thirds of volume and the one on the right to the power of one, this eventually takes all the energy available for growth and dVdt goes to zero. And that is, um, you can just rearrange this equation and you end up with something like this where you've got the ratio of the two terms, the, the anabolic parameter and the catabolic parameter giving you the maximum size. But you see this isn't quite the same, I've got um, K-A-M instead of K-A and I've got an F in front of it. So what this is, is a term that's curtailing the maximum possible um, anabolic um, coefficient. So this is the anabolic coefficient here again and it's being curtailed by this term which goes from zero to one, which is a, a ratio of the nutrient diffusion coefficient, which is in, in the numerator and denominator, and another term which is the somatic maintenance coefficient. And this nutrient diffusion coefficient is part of Putter's idea of how metabolism is happening. You've got this process here that is a building up process. So the organism's got these processes that are taking bits and pieces and putting them together to build the organism up um, while those things are falling apart at the same time. Uh, and the, the uh, Kn refers to the diffusion of the nutritive material that's being used to do the building up. So he was talking about this nutritive material as as part of his theory that, that has a certain coefficient of diffusion. And he used an analogy of what he called a cistern, essentially a bucket filling up with water that has a hole in it, where the diffusion rate of the nutrients that are being used for the buildup is, is determined by this Kn parameter, but there's also um, some of that energy is having to go on maintenance and also the cost of growth. And so um, that's the hole in the bucket. So the actual um, final Ka that turns up in this equation, this term here, uh, theoretically is thought of in, in this way as the balance between a nutritive supply term um, and a maintenance term. But he was never explicit about that nutritive material in his model. So that was Putter's model. Then um, there's von Bertalanffy, who was very interested in growth and had a massive impact on biology, especially through his um, idea of general systems theory thinking of organisms as open thermodynamic systems. Um, he was born in 1901 in Austria, and he died in the US in 1972, and had um, quite, a, quite a broad and varied career. So his PhD he did in 1926 um, in Vienna, and he spent a few more years in Vienna, but then he went and visited the US and was very excited to, to live in the US, but couldn't, had to return to Vienna. And then in, during the Second World, well, in the lead up to the Second World War, he actually joined the Nazi party and um, even linked his biological philosophy to Nazi ideology. Um, and 
I think he later relinquished a lot of those ideas and started, and left Vienna and went to um, travel around the world and held a whole lot of different positions in London, in Canada, in the US, and ultimately died in the US. And um, this is this is the picture of von Bertalanffy in 1926, and it's not clear what he's he's reading here as a as a PhD student, but it may well be Putter's article because he he read Putter's article on growth. Obviously, he could read in German, and um, and this heavily influenced him, and he developed his own ideas about growth based on Putter's ideas. So here's von Bertalanffy's growth equation, and you see he's written this in the con uh, in terms of change in weight per time. So he didn't work with volumes. And surface areas formally as Putter did, the change in weight per time. And he has a difference term here where he has an anabolic term like Putter with a parameter driving that, um, multiplied by S, the surface area, and a, and a catabolic term. So again, difference between anabolism and catabolism. And he said that you know the, anab the catabolic term is proportional to the to the weight, just like in Putter's model, where it was proportional to the volume. So it's essentially the same model, and he admits that and, and, and cites Putter for this equation. Um, but what he what he then did was to generalize it as an allometric model. So um, he he said you, you could just have a general term here uh, for a parameter relating to um, that you multiply the anabolic term by that isn't necessarily a surface specific one. You can have any exponent you want here with weight. So it could be something slightly different from a surface area response. And the same with the cat uh, catabolism term. It doesn't have to be proportional to weight. Uh, it could be proportional to some other power. So he actually went from uh, put his mechanistic ideas into a more of a phenomenological approach, um, which he never he admitted doesn't have an underlying mechanism. So. Some people use von, von Bertalanffy's ideas in, in the original context of Putters, and others take this um, generalized coefficient approach, like um, Marshall and White did in, in the previous slide, and, and just use it as a phenomenological model. Why, though, did this become associated with Bertalanffy's name? Well, that is because of this book on the dynamics of exploited fish populations by Beverton and Holt. So they were, it's an overview of, um, of, of fish populations and they had, they wanted to understand fish growth and they were hunting for a model that would be a good one to use. They said there's a whole lot of different approaches that have been done so far. The important thing is um, whether a, represent, a, represent, a representation can be made that is adequate for their particular purposes. And in their opinion, um, von Bertalanffy's growth model was the one, it was the best one. And so they, they tried out a lot of different models and, and, and von Bertalanffy's growth model was the best one. It was very influential for a lot of um, biologists and uh, they just referred to it as the von Bertalanffy growth model from then on. And even von Bertalanffy called it the Bertalanffy model in his own papers later, even though the guts of it came from Putter. So that's why Putter's name was lost in time in terms of the in terms of meta metabolic um, theory, in terms of growth in particular. Okay, so that's von Bertalanffy. Now there's another idea out there in the literature um, that is seen as a, as a formal theory of metabolism um, called the Gill Oxygen Limitation Theory or GALT. And that's was proposed by Daniel Pauly back in 1978. And he was really influenced by von Bertalanffy. And he talks about this equation of von Bertalanffy's and how there's a surface related term but he becomes explicit about the um, exact process that is being limited by surface area in his in his ideas, and that's oxygen supply. And he's relating this to fish and other water breathing ectotherms, which he cheekily refers to in this paper as WBEs, just to make it even more confusing with the WBE theory of um, the fractal branching constraint on metabolism. Um, so all these ideas are essentially um, taking von Bertalanffy's model, which essentially put Putter's model, but um, talking about it explicitly in terms of oxygen as a limiting factor. And if you want to read about Pauli's theory, he wrote a um, summary of it all uh, in a paper last year in Science Advances. And now we come to the dynamic energy budget theory of growth. Now in this formulation, I've actually removed, see this asterisk is indicating I've removed uh, the term we need for including reproduction here to keep it simple to start with. And so what we have is the rate of change of a volume. So the state variable is volume and it's the volume of something called structure that's being produced. 
And it's a difference between two terms, uh, not an anabolic term and a catabolic term as in Putter's model and the von Bertalanffy model, but between assimilation term and a maintenance term. So we have a surface area specific assimilation parameter multiplied through by the actual surface area, the, the volume of structure that, to the two thirds, gives us a flux of energy coming in as assimilates. And there's a flux of energy that needs to get taken up to maintain the structure. So that's this term multiplied by the um, volume. And the difference between those two can be used for growth. That's the energy for growth. And the ratio of these two parameters, PAM in curly brackets and PM in square brackets, is the ultimate length that the organism gets to. So just like in von bertel lanfys model, there's an asymptotic size that the organism is approaching because this flux is initially larger than this flux, but because this flux is going up with the volume and this flux is going up with the surface area, so not as fast, eventually um, there's nothing left. Maintenance taking, is taking everything and that is the ultimate length that the organism will get to. Um, so it's essentially going from a non-steady state at the beginning to a steady state of the final length. And that's the same idea as in Putter's model. But you can see there are um, some terms in the denominator here. One is this EG in square brackets, which is the, the cost of um, making the tissue. So it's converting from an amount of energy to the amount of volume of the tissue. And that includes the energy content of the tissue and the work that needs to be done to build the tissue. So the materials and the labor. But there's also this term here, E in square brackets, which is the reserve density. And that is another state variable of the dynamic energy budget theory model. And what this does is make Putter's idea of a nutritive material um, explicit. So you remember Putter had this idea that there's nutritive material diffusing to the point of the anabolic reactions um, for the growth and he had some parameters for them which he never actually used in his actual modeling when he's fitting it to real data. He never actually made the dynamics of that nutritive material explicit. Um, what dynamic energy budget theory is doing is making that explicit but with the concept of a, a density of energy within the structure Putter had an idea of a concentration in depth theory, it's a density. And so you can think of the reserve as these blobs of um, macromolecules that are being created by the process of, of assimilation. So food is being converted into these blobs. And then those blobs are being um, mobilized, the energy and matter in those blobs is being mobilized for doing work in the cell. And the dynamics of those blobs forming, um, growing and shrinking is, is, is determined by this equation here, which is the input from assimilation minus the flow out, which is, um, and divided by length. And essentially what this is saying is that the rate at which energy is flowing out of the reserve depends on the surface area interface between these blobs of reserve and the structure. Um, and so that's, it's proportional to the density of reserve over the length, which is the surface area of these blobs, um, which is simple geometry. And also this term energy conductance, which you can imagine there's all these enzymes eating away at the, um, at the reserve, mobilizing it. So the energy conductance you can think of as how many, how many enzymes there are per um, surface area of the reserve. So, so that's driving the dynamics of the reserve. Um, and the ultimate wet weight of the organism uh, is the combination of the structure and the reserve. So, so at a given moment in time, the wet weight is, is the summation of the mass of the reserve plus the mass of the structure. And that's what this term is indicating. So you've got the wet weight equals the volume of the structure and the density of that structure to give you a weight. And um, the energy of the reserve, the total energy, not in square brackets, but the total energy multiplied by the conversion factor to go from energy to moles to grams. And then like in Putter's model, there's a, there's a term F here that's constraining that maximum possible size, um, which can vary from zero to one. Um, and it is not connected to the nutritive material. That's all separately counted, accounted for by the um, reserve dynamics. It's actually reflecting the food. So the maximum assimilation rate um, depends on the food density and also this term, the half saturation constant. And this is, um, capturing the feeding process and so now feeding is explicit in the dynamic energy budget model. This way I formulated the um, dynamic energy budget model with PAM here in the denominator is actually assuming steady state in which case the reserve density is staying constant and it's just filling up uh, and emptying um, 
at the same rate because the food density is constant, but under fluctuating food, it's a different formulation with instead of you've got a reserve term up top here. And, and that accounts for the um, dynamic variation in food. And that's something that the dynamic energy budget model can handle. So that's the dynamic energy budget model. And then finally, we have the ontogenetic growth model that was published by West Brown and Enquist as a sort of follow on and building upon their idea about the constraints on metabolism that causes metabolic rates to scale with quarter powers, which was um, this idea of a branching network of, 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 supply, um, brand, of, of supply tubes that are providing resources to the cells. So their model is formulated um, as uh, DWDT, um, so in change in weight versus time, and it's a difference equation. And the original conceptualization of it was similar to the dynamic energy budget theory as a difference between assimilate supply and um, maintenance costs. But what they assumed was that the, the metabolic rate um, is representing the flow of energy materials to the body. So the metabolic rate scales with approximately mass to the three quarters, and so too does the overall supply then of the energy that's going into doing the growth. Um, but then you have to take away from that flow of the maintenance requirements. So similar to Deb theory in that sense, but um, what you have here is weight to the power of three quarters as driven by their ideas about the fractally branching network. And so it's not a two thirds um, versus power of one relationship here in terms of weight, it's three quarters versus one. And so the formulation looks a little bit um, different. To get the wet weight, the ultimate wet weight, it's the ratio of the, this um, assimilation constraint term to the maintenance term to the power of four to go from length to um, wet weight. Uh, so the, the, one of the arguments made about the power of this model, and I guess the reason it got into nature was they were claiming that all the parameters of this model are independently determined from the fundamental parameters of the cell. So the maintenance cost of an individual cell, uh, the weight of an individual cell, the energy content of an individual cell. But a number of people pointed out this wasn't quite right. And one of those was Anastasia Markareva, who was actually a uh, atmospheric physicist, um, but but also is interested in metabolism of, of living things. And she um, stated that the attempt to interpret these parameters as functions of measurable quantities, example, energy content of the cell, immediately resulted in the violation of the energy conservation law. And she showed this by thinking about how embryos grow and how what they were saying can't work um, when you generalize to embryos. Um, and Jaap van der Meer also pointed out um, an issue with this model, especially the, the notion of this term here referred to as the tissue energy content. Uh, in fact, um, it, they didn't have the overhead cost of growth in this model. So there were some problems pointed out and they went back to the drawing board and came up with another formulation a modification that also included the processes of assimilation explicitly. Um, so this was in science, um, the lead author was uh, Chen Hu. And now they're, um, if, if you look at this, this diagram down the bottom here, they're including the assimilation of food and they've got energy that is assimilated, some of that going into the content of the tissues. So this is the energy going into biomass production of growth. Um, and some of that going into um, work, which is this term here, some of that work energy that's just being dissipated is going into activity. And some of it is going into the resting metabolic rate, which is treated as the what you would measure as the resting metabolic rate, which is supplying energy to maintenance, but also growth. And so now they have the overhead cost of growth being treated here, the energy to do the building. And that's what this term now refers to in the growth model. So it's the growth is a result of a difference between the energy available for doing the work of growth versus the maintenance for what's being grown. And so the interpretation is that this is an overhead cost rather than a energy content of the tissue. Um, so this leads to other problems. Um, so uh, Tanya Souza and colleagues pointed out that this makes, th this formulation has not been extended to include um, anything other than juveniles. So there's no reproduction going on um, and there's no embryos. Um, and they also cannot uh, um, account for uh, fluctuating food, but they were, they were pointing out this problem with 
embryos and and um, and reproduction not being incorporated. So how is reproduction development and embryos, how, how are they incorporated in these growth models? Well, Puta just didn't do it. Puta was simply focused on um, growth of the soma and so was von Bertel Amphi. In the dynamic energy budget theory, the growth, but sorry, the, the um, energy going to reproduction is accounted for by the kappa rule and it adds one more parameter to the, to the model, kappa which is the fraction of energy that's being mobilized out of the reserve that's going into growth and maintenance. The remaining one minus kappa fraction is then going into reproduction as an adult or the process of development maturation as um, a juvenile or an embryo. Um, the ontogenetic growth model in its initial formulation um, where this term was seen as energy flowing to the cells, energy and materials flowing to the cells, was done, did have a way of incorporating reproduction with some extra parameters where you pay maintenance and there's also a cost for reproduction that reduces the ultimate size that they would have if they didn't reproduce. Um, but that doesn't work if this term is actually simply the overhead costs of um, the, the growth because then it's just the overhead cost of the actual um, reproduction process. And they incorporated development simply by deleting the maintenance term in their growth equation, but um, that is rendering the, the model a phenomenological model because there isn't an explicit process now um, for the maintenance of the embryo as it grows, but it must incorporate maintenance costs into its growth. Whereas the dynamic energy budget theory can handle both because the kappa rule is giving the costs of maturation, so development is now explicit in the model, and also because it's got um, the reserve as a state variable, what what happens during um, juvenile growth is you're going from a, a non-steady state in terms of um, size to a steady state where the balance is equal between what's coming in from assimilation and what's going out from maintenance. In the case of the embryo, you're going from a non-steady state of the reserve density where you start with a massive amount of reserve and a tiny amount of structure, and it gradually converges to the steady state um, reserve density. Um, and that's the embryo using the yolk to grow without having to feed. And so feeding is simply turned off and the DEB model is able to capture embryonic development um, without any extra parameters other than the kappa parameter. So they are the growth models um, now presently in the literature that you can think of as mechanistic individual growth models that could be used as a basis to metabolic theory. So the remainder of this talk, and I'm, I'm running out of time, um, is comparing and synthesizing these a little bit more. And I'm not going to um, talk about all of these things that are in the table of contents, but I'm going to emphasize, first of all, just a summary of how we interpret individual growth. And then I'll emphasize the um, issues of parameter richness, um, the, the temperature size rule, and a bit about life history and evolution. So to, to try and summarize this, we really have three different sets of ideas for growth. Um, we have Putter's idea of growth being the difference between anabolism and catabolism. We have the dynamic energy budget theory with the growth being the difference between assimilation and maintenance and with reserves explicit. Uh, and we have the ontogenetic growth model, um, which is considering the constraints on growth caused by the limitations of supply down a network. All three models can characterize growth fine, especially growth at constant food uh, and temperature for an ectotherm. So here's the brown rat, and I can fit those models um, equally well to the length trajectory of the brown rat. They all converge to the same sort of equation to put as original equation, in fact, um, although slightly different exponents in the ontogenetic growth model. But if we look at the flows of energy that are underlying the growth, uh, on the bottom graph, we have energy flow in joules per day and body length in centimeters. In the Putter model, this red line represents the anabolic energy, uh, or anabolic flow of energy, and the, the blue line, the catabolic flow of energy. And you can see it starts off with a, there's a, a more flow to anabolism than maintenance, or there's a net difference, and so that can drive growth. It, the difference peaks um, around the, the midpoint of growth, um, and, and then gradually um, the catabolic costs take everything and, and growth asymptotes. And in the dynamic energy budget theory you have a similar situation, but it's now assimilation that the red line represents and maintenance costs that the blue line represents. But also because we've got this um, 
fraction, one minus kappa of the mobilized reserve going to reproduction, then we have, and, and to, to development, we've got this other flux of energy um, that has to be met by food, which would be on top of the food required to do the growth, that is going to that process of maturation and reproduction. With the ontogenetic growth model, um, what we have is instead of energy going into the tissues, we have the anabolic flux to do the work of growth represented by the red line, hence it's a lower value. And the maintenance costs are also have to be lower to, uh, to allow the growth to occur. Um, and so when you fit the parameters, you would get a different interpretation of maintenance here. Um, and then of course, the actual mass that goes into the tissue, which is um, including the energy content of the tissue and not just the overhead costs, just matches or is just is scaled by a coefficient so that you get the appropriate um, wet mass out at the end. So quite a different interpretation, even though they are the same looking growth curves. Now, one common issue that you see discussed in the context of metabolic theory is that um, the dynamic energy budget theory has a whole lot of parameters compared to the ideas in the metabolic theory sphere. Um, and, and so when uh, replying to the criticisms of Sousa and also Marco Riva, um, the, the group that were developing the, um, the ontogenetic growth model argued that the dynamic energy budget theory is fine, but it requires lots of parameters and variables, specifically 17 variables and 18 parameters to be measured for every species, whereas theirs only needs two variables, um, mass and time and five parameters. And they were referring to one of um, Tanya's papers where she, she and her colleagues have listed a whole lot of processes and symbols for a whole lot of things. So it's actually, that was completely wrong. This is not um, the, the list of, of uh, the minimal state variables and parameters. So what are they? What is that list? Let's compare the Puda model, um, the DEB model and the ontogenetic growth model. First for the state variables, Puda just has um, volume. The dynamic energy budget theory has four volume, reserve density, the maturity level, and the energy that's gone into the reproduction buffer. And the ontogenetic growth model, when it is incorporating reproduction and development, has uh, four state variables, um, so equivalent. Uh, in terms of core parameters, Putter's model has five, the dynamic energy budget theory has nine, and the ontogenetic growth model has 10. Um, so actually when you account for how many processes that are being brought into the models, like the ontogenetic growth model and the dynamic energy budget model can be simplified to not include maturation and reproduction um, and fluctuating food. But when you, um, when you do allow for those things, then you end up with more parameters and you can't escape that for either model. Um, and then in terms of auxiliary pr parameters that are needed to relate the model to the real world observations, the dynamic, the, the, Put a model just needs this um, metric to convert a, a notion of structural length into real weight. Um, whereas the dynamic energy budget model needs more because it's got to go from reserve and structure to wet mass and so on, it needs six. Whereas the ontogenetic growth model, because it's already written in terms of wet weight, doesn't need as many parameters to convert um, to measurable observations. So overall, um, really, there isn't that much in it between the dynamic energy budget theory and the ontogenetic growth model. Um, and the Putter model has fewer, but it's, it's, countering, it's accounting for fewer processes. So there's no argument in terms of which modeling approach to use from a number of parameters point of view. Um, it's, it's, it's more to a, an interpretation um, and appropriateness point of view that we should be thinking. Now, one other thing I wanted to mention in this context was the temperature size rule for two reasons. The temperature size rule was really pointed out by David Atkinson in, in, when it became a, a very widely known phenomenon in a review he wrote in 1994. And it's the tendency for um, organisms to be smaller when reared at, at higher temperatures. Um, an example of this from a recent study by Hofnagel and colleagues is for Daphnia magna, where they reared different clonal lines of Daphnia at different temperatures. And they saw that the size of maturity declined, the asymptotic size declined and the neonatal size and I had a funny response of a, of a, a curvy linear response. But this is very widespread seen across many different taxa. And a metabolic theory should be able to explain this. Now, Putter, oh, von Bertel Amphi, I should say, had an explanation for this, um, where he was basically saying that the anabolic um, 
processes involved diffusion related processes and reaction related processes um sorry the, the catabolic um processes it should have a, a steeper reaction rate than the anabolic processes because the anabolic processes are more of a diffusion process and so the, so he explained the temperature size rule to do with the different temperature sensitivities of anabolism and catabolism um Actually, that was Putter's idea, and he completely stole it from Putter and never acknowledged this. So this is in Putter's original paper, exactly the same argument. So von Bertalampi is cited as having you know, the first theoretical explanation for the temperature size rule, but just want to set the record straight here and point, it out, point out that Putter first observed the pattern in, in broad detail and described it across multiple species, and then came up with a theoretical explanation, which has been uh, discounted however looking at the data and in fact there aren't any explanations for the temperature size rule from a formal mechanistic theory as yet um, fully worked out there are some ideas but uh, this is a challenge for metabolic theory explaining the temperature size rule but finally i just want to say something about life history uh, so in life history theory there's these classic books on life history theory by stearns and roth and they point out that life history is um, the result of both constraint especially in terms of energy conservation um, and optimization by natural selection. And in those books, they really do emphasize the optimization side of things and not so much the constraint, but metabolic theory gives you um, important constraints. And so I think there's a lot of power to apply metabolic theory in this context to help us work out what the, what the constraining factors are so that we can then better target what needs to be looked at from a natural selection optimization process. But also I think there's a lot of scope to really test metabolic theories out, especially the, the way that, um, meta, that life history traits co-vary in the organism, how um, development and growth and reproduction are related. So there's a, quite a bit of action going on in this topic at the moment. So there's a paper called Towards Metabolic Theory of Life History by um, Jim Brown and, and Joseph Berger and Jen Hu. Um, back in 2003, there's a really great paper by Dina Leaker and Bas Koyman applying dynamic energy budget theory um, in the context of life histories of determinant growers like insects that just grow and stop and then reproduce versus indeterminate growers. It's interesting too because because this first paper is is taking the approach of pay maintenance and then have flexibility with what you do with the remainder in terms of growth and reproduction whereas the dynamic energy budget theory is quite interesting because it has an extra level of architecture driven by the capital. And there are a couple of papers that came out um, this year in Ecology Letters that are applying metabolic theory and thinking about life history that I've just put up there um, for you to see. But so, so I think in the future, I see this is the real testing ground for metabolic theory. And hopefully there's a lot more work looking at the details of different organisms with different life histories and especially doing uh, experimental evolution and seeing whether we can um, understand the outcomes of those experiments in the context of metabolic theory. Okay, to summarize and conclude, um, what I've really been trying to emphasize in this talk is that we have Putter to thank um, for kickstarting the field of metabolic theory about 100 years ago um, when he presented his interesting ideas on growth being the difference between anabolic processes, which happen to be proportional to surface areas of the organism, and catabol catabolism, which is proportional to volume. I'd also like to thank Buzz Coyman at this point for pointing out Putter to me. Um, and a lot of what I've said about Putter in this talk, um, I learned about from Buzz, but also I learned a lot more after reading in detail his paper. And I really recommend that you read his paper. He also, of course, was the first person to point out the temperature size rule and, and nobody really knows about this. Um, Von Bertel Amphi played an important role in taking Putter's work on. Uh, probably none of us would have heard of this if, if it wasn't for Von Bertel Amphi talking about Putter's model. Uh, and, and Von Bertel Amphi was also a really important figure in thinking about organisms as thermodynamic systems, open thermodynamic systems. Um, but he generalized the exponents in Putter's model and actually made it less mechanistic. Beverton and Holt then popularized the equation that Putter developed and it became known kind of unfairly as the Von Bertel Amphi growth curve hence the title of my talk. Um, the Gill oxygen and limitation theory was a spin-off from all of these ideas with the emphasis on a mechanism being the constraint of oxygen uh, being transported across the surface of the gills. Um, this argument 
is interesting and it's probably important in some cases that oxygen is actually limiting, but it can't be the general explanation, of course, because these patterns in, the, in similarities of growth across, across organisms extends beyond water breathers. Then the ontogenetic growth model, um, in a sense you can see has been derived from the von Birchel amphigrowth model, but working with the generalized exponents and, and, and coming up with a mechanistic interpretation of why the exponents would have the values that they did. Um, but in terms of the way it was mechanically you know, derived, initially, as I mentioned, it was thinking about energy and matter flowing down those branches as being constrained. And later on, it, it became more about oxygen, something that's non-storable, uh, even though this isn't really explicitly stated in the theory. Um, various thing, attempts were done to bring in um, feeding and, and development and maturation and reproduction, but um, it's proved challenging. And I think that is in part because uh, the underlying structure of the current version of the model is this difference between anabolism and maintenance, um, which is which I think is problematic. And um, there's still work going on within this this idea of, of um, quarter power scaling in terms of growth models. Um, Sibley and Brown recently published a paper arguing that assimilation scales with could be seen to scale with mass to the two thirds and maintenance with mass to the three quarters. Um, but all the while, um, dynamic energy budget theory has been bubbling along. So starting off in 1986, really drawing from Putter's model, um, we have the, the main formulation of dynamic energy budget theory that is account, has reserve and structure as state variables can deal with embryos and has assimilation and feeding explicit. And then um, later on, development was included or maturation as a formal state variable and the theory was extended to non-isomorphic organisms, things that don't grow according to the von, von Bertel Amphi growth pattern, or the putter growth pattern. Um, some really important developments were made in the 2000 book in terms of connecting uh, stoichiometry into this field and, and going from a mass balance to an energy balance. And then that allowed an entropy balance to be made. So um, that was also very important. And then a mechanism was de derived for the reserve dynamics in 2010. So the DEV theory has come straight from Putter and has continually expanded in its breadth and, um, and uh, sophistication. And I think this is the last one standing of all the ideas so far. It's come from Putter. And I think um, there is no argument in the literature that I see why there's anything uh, unsuitable about this model, but I think that it probably deserves a lot more scrutiny by theoretical minds um, than it has. And I guess we don't have a lot of um, people in ecology with that kind of background um, who can really seriously, or in, in biology in general, um, to really seriously um, consider all of these models. So I really hope that a lot more theoretical people come into this field of metabolic theory and um, that we can build on, on all of the work that's been done in this topic so far. And Vas Koyman has quite provocatively stated that there are no alternatives to the standard dynamic energy budget model um, that are consistent with the way we know things grow. He was kind of hoping there would be and couldn't think of any. So that's another challenge to the theorists out there. But overall, I think um, you know, there's a whole lot of exciting potential um, for us to apply metabolic theory in ecology. Jim Brown provided that vision in 1995 in his book on macroecology. Um, and uh, I think there's a huge amount of scope to, to take those ideas and apply what we know about um, metabolic theory now. Um, and as I say, dynamic energy budget theory is I think a way to go about this. And also to bring in some of these biophysical notions of heat and, and water exchange and so on. And I think we can really um, bring all of these things together and answer some of the big questions that Jim Brown envisaged, envisaged in his book or pointed out in his book. And I think in doing all of this, we're going to have much greater power for making forecasts of the way our natural systems are going to change in the future um, as the climate changes, as, as we continue to disturb our environments. So thanks for listening and um, I'll take questions one way or another.